Needless to say, as I was telling you earlier about my experience in martial arts, I did not get promoted that year. I needed to learn something. That even though I worked at the school, I don't need to let pride be so shown as it was. That was a big problem of mine. And I definitely learned my lesson after that because it made me realize there's always someone bigger and better than you. But as I've shared before, pride still is one of those struggles that I have in my life. Now, I always have to be on guard against and letting that even slightly get near me. Just like other people in the world have various struggles with sin issues, it just takes a little bit to get a person hooked back into it and drawn away from the Lord. So as you're looking at your copy of God's Word this morning, and the idea that we're talking about a fight. You know, whenever I was in school, it would happen. Somebody would get in a fight. All the kids would just cram up together and go, fight, 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 and just start screaming. And it was something to celebrate, woo-hoo, and then they'd get in a circle and just watch. I'm sure whenever you were in school, y'all had a different word, maybe squabble, squabble, squabble. I don't, I don't know what words were. Tussle, roll around. I don't, I don't know what the words were when y'all were in school, but it happened, right? Think of that. Kids are at a year, early age celebrating violence. If you watched the debate the other night, you would have probably thought that it was two middle school children just squabbling with one another. Mankind has seen many different types of conflicts through history, and it doesn't even have to be war. It can be political, as we've seen this past week. Schools competing against each other, sports teams, boxing even. Oh, and the oh-so-popular cage fighting, UFC. For the most part, Christians tend to take a specific stance or position on those type of events. For the most part is, don't watch it, don't pay for it, don't enjoy it, don't have anything to do with it. That's predominantly the Christian worldview. Don't celebrate violence, especially two of God's creatures just mutilating each other. But this thing is still today really, really celebrated. With that in mind, how often do we as God's people give into matters of internal conflict that we have within us? How often does that happen? Let's look at chapter 5 of verse 17 this morning. It says this, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Think about it. There's a fight going on in the lives of believers. Even people that are not saved. Don't just think that it's all on us that we deal with sin struggles. They deal with them. Most of the time, they'll not give in to various sin struggles, but it's easier for them to give in to it. But we have Christ on our side to help us work through these, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So let's join together in prayer and speaking to God this morning. Father, thank you for this time, and thank you for your word. Thank you for Paul and his message to the church in Galatia, to those people where serious sin issues run rampant. And he boldly and proudly proclaimed that we cannot sit idly by and allow sin to run rampant in our lives. God, help us to give a gain a better and fuller understanding of what this text means and what we are supposed to do in this war against sin. Father, we love you and ask that you bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Flesh being that which we're talking about, and you can actually see what the description of the works of the flesh are in verses 19 to 21. Sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, revelries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. Things like this. We've done this text before. Jeff, you preached those texts. 
I preach those texts. So why are we talking about it again? Well, that's why we're focusing on verse 17. So you are all well familiar with the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. Hopefully not so in depth as the works of the flesh, but you definitely understand the works of the spirit, what that fruit is. We've talked about it. So being so well versed, Let's go with the very first thing I want you to get this morning. It's time to join the fight. Yes, your pastor is telling you you need to be in a fight. It is okay to fight. Insofar as what we're talking about this morning. No, I don't mean violently attacking one another or anything like that. I was uh, with some men last night. And I said, hey, come to church tomorrow. We're going to talk about fighting. They're like, can I bring my gun? Not that kind of fighting, but we are to be involved in fights. Something within us is constantly fighting the good, being Christ. We each have something occasionally that we may even be relaxed and throw our support in on and motivate and encourage that fleshly desire. And no, it is not just speaking of that list. If you notice at the end of verse uh, 21, it actually is telling us that other things like these, there are other forms of sin. Humans tend to look at a serial killer as being the absolute worst sin possible. Again, most of you understand this truth. A lie is no different than being a serial killer. It's sin before mighty God. He abhors all sin equally. A white lie. If a person goes through their entire life and just says one little lie. Yes, I went to bed at 8 o'clock when you went to bed at 8.05. It's technically a lie. And then having the one person that goes through the life of serial murder, or serial rape, a serial anything, evil, just a pure evil person. They are still guilty of the same sin. It's still even they will still face judgment for it. So it doesn't matter how kind of a good person you are or what all is going on in your life, we still struggle with sin. No matter what it is, and it has no weight over another as humans tend to think it does. Don't be that and don't think that. Moving on from there. So the sin struggle, and maybe it's easy to give into it and just do a little something or forget about it. It could be inadvertent. You inadvertently just forget. You just let your guard down and simply just let it happen. Again, not intentionally. I may just let my guard down for a second and think, man, I'm a good looking man. I see none of you are in conflict over that, but you say, I'm, I am, I am a handsome, awesome man. Yeah, I'm good. It's allowing pride to creep into my life. I just relaxed for a second and looked in the mirror. Yeah. An ego is easy to let back in. And it's not the sexual impurities, immoralities all the time. It can be other things. Anger. Envy. Jealousy. Fits of rage. Meaning just spontaneous, like, I'm angry. Instantly. But in this fight that we are supposed to be in, there's really no referee. Actually, the referee is involved in the fight. The Holy Spirit. Satan and his demons and everybody are in all manner of evil are in the fight. The referees, the Holy Spirit is actually getting beat on, being attacked. You don't believe me? Think about it. Look at the news and see something where people are just bashing churches, Christians doing and saying goofy things. There was a church several years ago that they were just blasting social media with just hate language, but they were hiding it under the guise of, oh, it's scriptural. This is biblical. Abhor all these sinful things, but they were doing it in a hateful manner. That's not Christ's love at all. Are they guilty of a sin? Yeah, I would think so. But 
we can sit back and look at the Holy Spirit in this fight and say, you know what, the Holy Spirit's got this. He's strong enough. He can deal with this. That's very true. But if you allow sin struggles to go on and the Holy Spirit just do the fight and we don't get involved intentionally with our sin struggles or those things of this world, you're inviting collateral damage. We invite other issues to happen in and around our lives. The Holy Spirit's got this. If we don't actively involve ourselves with it in fighting against it, it can affect our families, our friends, our other relationships we have, our jobs, our own sanity. We allow ourselves to just be overtaken by depression, sadness. Do you not think that that's going to affect your marital life? Your relationship with your friends, your schoolwork, your work? 100% yes, it will. If we don't take a stance and just say, God, you'll take care of it. That's not it at all. God has given us the ability to actively work on dealing with these sin struggles. But see, the rest of the text at the very bottom, and it does say, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Easy to keep you from just going nuts, going crazy and just doing whatever you want. Paul later addressed this in the letters. That do you just sin so that grace can abound? No, not at all. Actively get involved with these struggles. And that's what the last part of this means. We have been given the power to fight a little dirty. That just sounds a little weird. We have the right to fight dirty? Think about it. Satan and his demons, as Jeff said earlier, have been doing this for a long time. They have been actively in the world, interacting with people, learning people, just sitting back. I wonder what makes Dick work. Let's think about Dick Small for a second. I got him. And then it just takes an instant for them to just put those little things in the back of his mind to do something. Like want to beat up on his pastor. I don't know. But it doesn't take much for them to just sit back and actively listen and learn and look at. And again, Satan and his demons have been doing this for thousands of years. They've almost perfected it possibly. They know how to wage war against us. Do you think that Satan's fighting fair? And the truth is, God really isn't either. Think about it. A couple of things. Number one, we have our wits about us. We have our intelligence, intelligence to be able to wage war. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Second, we have each other to lift us up and build one another up. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. We have God's word. 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. And finally, the best of all. You ready for it? This is how we know God's not fighting fair against Satan and his demons and evil. We have the top three best contenders ever. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three of them are in our corner. Now, if you have that many helping you out, think about the fight that you're in. Are you allowing a handicap in your life to just let the Holy Spirit work and forget everything else. Or maybe you work and are actively involved in something, but on occasion you don't know what to think, you don't know what, how to deal with certain issues, and you forget that you have brothers and sisters in Christ to call on and say, brother, I need help, I need prayer. Maybe you just forget to talk to God, invoke Christ's name, allow yourself to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We have a lot of ammunition to fight with in this war, but are we utilizing it all to fight against Satan and this evil? When we join in with all of the resources at our disposal to combat sin, to combat evil, sin has no chance in our lives. It really doesn't. When you use all these tools at your disposal, sin has no help, no leg to stand on. But sadly, 
we can let our guard down and forget about our brothers in Christ and forget to ask for prayer or for help because of pride or a little cowardice because I don't want them to know what I'm dealing with. I don't want them to think of me that way, that I'm actually a human being. Do you not think that I went to the gym this week and driving around or seeing people walking around or doing anything that you're not confronted with sin or a 38 year old man is not confronted with it. Ladies, do you not think that your husband sees things? Wives? Or husbands, do you think that your wives are not interacted or seen things or bombarded with stuff? But I don't want people to know I'm human and that I am a real human being that struggle with things. You need friends, you need scripture, you need prayer, you need Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all of them. And your friends tend to be one of your best line of defenses. I have two that I, no matter what, no matter what it is, we made a promise years ago that I can tell them anything and there, there's no judgment, there's just love. I have a best friend that struggled with a huge, life-altering sin issue, but was bold enough to tell me so that I could love on him and encourage him. You know what? He's better for it. And I still constantly check on him because it needs to be a constant fight we cannot give up on for a single second just because we think our age has no bearing, our gender has no bearing, our place in life. We can't let our guard down. Number two, the forces of evil know how to fight. As I've said before, Satan's been doing this for a long, 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 long time. He knows how to push your buttons, what to do, what to put in front of you. That little antagonizing voice, hey, it's okay, you don't need to go to church. Hey, it's okay, turn the channel over here, nobody's around. Hey, open your phone and let's do this. Satan knows a lot. And sitting back knows how to hook you. You know, I know that the way things are, and I'm going to go through this kind of slowly because I have something to share for you. Knowing that we have young people here, I use my language differently. So just listen and try to catch on to what I'm talking about. This is a script of an interview between an interviewer and a murderer and a rapist. Listen to the conversation. The interviewer says, how did it happen? Take me back. What are the antecedents of your behavior that we've seen? You were raised in what you consider to be a healthy home. You were not physically or carnally or emotionally abused. The individual says no, and that's the part of the tragedy of this whole situation. I grew up in a wonderful home with two dedicated and loving parents as one of my five brothers and sisters. We as children were the focus of our parents' love. We generally attended church, or excuse me, we regularly attended church. My parents did not drink or smoke or gamble. There was no physical abuse or fighting in the home. I'm not saying it was leave it to beaver, but it was a fine, solid Christian home. I hope no one will try to try the easy way out of this and accuse my family of contributing to this. I know, and I'm trying to tell you as honestly as I know how, what happened. As a young boy of 12 to 13, I encountered outside of the home in local grocery stores and drugstores, visual representations of individual indecency. You follow? Young boys, explore the sideways and byways of their neighborhoods and in our neighborhood people would dump the garbage from time to time we would come across books of that nature more graphic so this also included detective magazines and small books and i want to emphasize this the most dangerous kind of these things and i'm talking about from hard real personal experience is that involves violence and carnal violence. The wedding of these two forces, as I know only too well, bring about behavior that is too terrible to describe. The interviewer asked, walk me through that. What was going on in your mind at the time? Before we go any, for, any further, 
it's important to me that people believe what I'm saying. I'm not blaming these visual representations. I'm not saying it caused me to go out and do certain things. I take full responsibility for all the things that I did. That's not the question here. The issue is how this kind of literature contributed and helped mold and shape the kinds of violent behavior. I knew it was a wrong thing to do, and certainly to do it was wrong. I was on the edge. The last vestiges of restraint were being tested constantly and assailed through the kind of fantasy life that fueled largely by this stuff. You know, going on, and then he later on, after a lengthy discussion, he actually says this. I can't restore much of them, speaking of the victims and the families. If I can't restore much or if anything. I won't pretend to, and I don't even expect them to forgive me. I'm not asking for it. That kind of forgiveness is of God. If they have it, they have it. If they don't, maybe they'll find it someday. The interviewer said, do you deserve the punishment the state has inflicted on you? He says, no, I don't want to die. But yes, I deserve because of what I have done. The interviewer asked, there's a tremendous cynicism about you on the outside, I suppose, for good reason. I'm not sure there's anything you could say that people would believe. Yet you told me that you have accepted forgiveness of Jesus Christ and a follower and believer of him. Do you draw strength from that as you approach these final hours? I do. I can't say that being in the valley of shadow of death is something I've become all that accustomed to and that I'm strong and nothing's bothering me. It's no fun. It gets kind of lonely. Yet I have to remind myself that every one of us will go through this someday one way or the other. The very next morning, Robert... Ted Bundy was executed at 7.15 a.m. The interviewer is Dr. James Dobson. I know I was alive during this. I was much younger, didn't realize what was going on. But do you remember that people were, you may have seen the news articles or watched the news on TV that people were, hundreds of people were outside celebrating this, shooting off fireworks. It was a party. And as soon as the hearse pulled up, Everybody started cheering. According to his testimony, he was a believer. But that's not what I want you to focus on this morning. Yes, that is wonderful. If he has been redeemed and he is with the Lord right now. But it was him acknowledging that he had a problem. And what created an even bigger issue in his life. Though he took the blame... But those sensual interactions with books, TV, whatever, contributed to that, created an even bigger problem. If we leave sin unchecked and just going through it, going through life, not dealing with it, it can become a serious problem. Not just these type of situations like he's speaking of here. Imagine if you say one little lie. You don't stop it with children early on with lies. What that will turn into later on in life. We need to actively be involved with downtrodden, destroying sin in life. Actively fighting it. Actively. I know that you probably thought of something in your, heart, in your head, in your mind, of something that you deal with. I have as well. What are you actively doing to fight it? Or are you? It seems harsh, but I love you because we're family. And I'd expect you to ask me the same thing. What am I doing? I'm actively communicating with my wife. I'm actively communicating with my best friends. I'm actively searching through scripture. I'm actively praying. I'm, acting, I'm actively invoking Christ's name. 
I'm actively removing possibilities of doing something that would get me in trouble or cause me to sin. That's the hard part. Get rid of stuff that you've grown so accustomed to. Maybe it's not even the sensual stuff. Maybe it's, I just, I like food. I like gumbo. Do you know how easy it is to distract you and get you turned off or turned towards sin? Let me give you an example. A couple of weeks, I'm going to hopefully prepare a big, huge pot of gumbo for my aunt and uncle and my mother and stepfather and my, cut, my little nephews and my boys. We're going to just sit and eat that big pot of gumbo. How about a hunting trip? You're going to get your freezer full of meat. Oh, I got it. I just got an alert on my phone. I felt it because my kids just posted new pictures of my grandchildren as, I'm, as you're sitting here. I'm ready to go fish as soon as I get that boat fixed. How many of you were thinking of one of those things as I said it? I just got you distracted. Wasn't talking about scripture. I was talking about gumbo. I was talking about pictures of your grandchildren. It's that easy to get you distracted. Think about what Satan can do to you. Do to all of us. Do to our family members. Do to our friends. It is that simple and easy for Satan to do it. If I can do it easily, just stand in here making an example. And he'll get you. The application for today is this. Join the fight. Get in a fight. Knock out, drag out, fight against sin in your life. Encourage someone else. If you know someone is struggling with something, don't hold back. Don't be afraid of hurting your feelings. You're dealing with their eternal soul and their walk with Christ. Don't be worried about hurting their feelings so I don't want to make it awkward or uncomfortable for them. Make it awkward and uncomfortable so that they veer away from it forever. James chapter 3, verse 2, for we all stumble in many ways. Everyone does. No matter your age, no matter who you are, where you are in life. Likewise, in Romans chapter 7, verse 23 says, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. We all struggle. We all have something, and we are all to wage war. Get in a fight against it actively. Because all you need to do is just let your guard down, and then you're a prisoner to it for even longer. And you're in a world of hurt. Number one, acknowledge that there is an issue. That's the hardest thing to do is saying, yep, I have an issue. And it may not be the most grandiose as humans think. Memorize Scripture. Know how to reason through Scripture dealing with that issue. Asking God through Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to strengthen you with the power of the Holy Spirit to deal with that whenever you're assaulted by the temptation of sin. I don't think God's going to totally outright remove it. He would have to remove the entirety of that sin from the whole world. And the time for that has not yet come. Confiding in someone else. That's, I promise, that is the healthiest and one of the best ways we can as humans deal with sin struggles. Talk to somebody that you know is not going to be like, <laughs> Jeff, did you hear about Billy Stewart? Find somebody that's going to love on you, no matter what. If you can't find someone around, I'm confident in Jeff, and I'm confident in myself. I'm confident in Don. I'm confident in Haley. Talk to them. As soon as you pull that Band-Aid, it's freedom, man. It's freedom. So join the winning side. Because though we're in this fight, victory is already announced, amen? We won, but it doesn't mean that we can sit idly by and do nothing. Get up and fight. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for allowing us to gather here this morning.